Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, one of the things that comes out, we'll talk a little bit more about Hannah's video, but one of the things that comes out in the video uh, that really struck me is grandma um, praying and reading her Bible and then reading a psalm to uh, Hannah and having an impact all these years later. And it just reminded me of the parent huddle that we have, and it's just an encouragement to you. If you are a parent or caregiver, grandparent, aunt, uncle, and you're uh, having an influence in young people's lives, we just encourage you to be there just to get a little more uh, foundational work on what it looks like to have an impact uh, on little people's lives. And uh, I think most of us just need to be a part of that parent huddle. So I just encourage you uh, to do that. Hey, we're going to take a couple minutes um, and pray uh, for our friend Phil Mattis yesterday at the men's breakfast. Uh, Phil was our speaker, and while he was speaking, he suffered a heart attack um, and collapsed. Uh, the men that were there, uh, in my opinion, acted in pretty heroic fashion and swooped him up and got him to St. John's uh, very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of trauma uh, witnessing something like that, so we want to pray for the men, uh, but we especially just want to take a pause and pray for Phil. He's still at St. John's in ICU. Uh, heavily sedated. We just want to pray for uh, God's complete healing and mercy in that situation. His wife's name is Trina. Phil has been uh, an anchor and just uh, an important part of grace for uh, a couple decades. Uh, So we're just going to stop and pray. We're going to do it a little bit differently. And I just encourage you, if you're uncomfortable with what we're about to do, it's okay. You don't have to pray out loud, but you can just Uh, listen in, but I'm going to ask you to just kind of huddle up in small groups, uh, however you can do that comfortably, and and just pray. And I encourage you to pray out, someone to just pray out loud for uh, Phil, Trina, pray for the men that were a part of that group, and we're just going to let you pray for a little bit together, then I'll come up and I'll close everything. So just gather however you feel comfortable. If you're really uncomfortable with that, just pray where you are, that's fine. Uh, But we want to pray for Phil, his wife's name is Trina, and all those who were impacted by this. Lord, we just thank you that you are a God who hears, that you are a God who sees, that you love Phil, you love Trina uh, more than anyone else. And uh, we pray for healing. We pray that uh, you would restore um, health to our friend Phil. Pray that we would have an opportunity to celebrate. Uh, We just talked, even when we were in the hospital yesterday, about 
how cool it would be a year from now in September to kick off the men's uh, fall with Phil as our keynote speaker again. And just uh, if you would uh, have that for us, we would just ask that you would do it in the powerful name of Jesus. We ask for healing. We ask that you would bring comfort to our sister Trina and the family and to his daughters. We just pray uh, that you would enter into this whole thing, that you would be glorified through all that takes place. We thank you that you are a God who sees, you are a God who heals, that you are a God who hears, uh, that you are actively involved in our lives, and we just uh, thank you uh, for Phil. I ask that you would touch his body in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being willing to do that with us. Hey, uh, things are a little bit different this morning. Uh, I'm going to invite my awesome and lovely wife, uh, Meg, to the stage. Uh, and we are going to explore Psalm 91 together. Uh, I talked this morning at the first service about uh, some influential friends that were here, the Stroms, and how they have uh, impacted my life in more ways than I can even count. Uh, no one has impacted my life more than Meg. Watching her walk with Jesus has been uh, a joy and an inspiration. And I love you. Thanks for being up Aww, here. Thanks. Love you too. So we are going to uh, explore Psalm 91. So I encourage you to grab your Bibles or journals and turn to Psalm 91. If you didn't bring a Bible, uh, there's one under your seat, so you can still turn there and just have it open. Um, we're just going to kind of work our way through some of the verses uh, as we talk through this. Um, and I think the best way to start is maybe just have you share um, why Psalm 91. Well, first of all, Psalm 91, because Josh Munoz stole Psalm 65 and preached on that. So I'd been meditating on Psalm 65 for about a year and uh, was, you know, hoping to talk through it with you. And then we went on vacation and Josh preached on it, which he did a great job. Yes, Yay, he did. Josh. So we, we pivot. We, we pivoted to Psalm 91, which also has been a longtime favorite of mine, Psalm 91 for sure. Just the comforting words, the, um, you know, those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. It's one of those psalms that I have in my back pocket. What does that mean? You have a psalm in your back pocket. Well, you think, don't literally have it in your back pocket. No, no. I think we, I think we all have um, passages of scripture like that, that we've either committed to memory or we know where they are in scripture. And if we're going through um, a time when we're afraid or there's suffer suffering, just, you know, like Hannah was talking about those, you know, those fearful times that Psalm 91 has brought peace to her. And I think we just all have um, places in God's word that we uh, snuggle up to. Um, I've always thought of Psalm 91 uh, as a place for me to go to when I'm in a storm. So it says, those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. I imagine myself like snuggling up under God's wing, you know, being in his shadow, waiting for the storm to pass, you know, and then I'm like, oh, okay. And then I <laughs> move on and then the next storm comes, you know, and I, and I snuggle up next to him. So that's, that's kind of how I've interacted with Psalm 91 over the years. Right. And you wanted to mention before we get too far that there's a couple of influential books that have shaped some of what we're talking about today. Yes. So I have been spending some time in um, a classic, The uh, Practice of the Presence of God. This is about the story of Brother Lawrence, who was a 17th century monk. And it's about how he made a habit, a practice, like a rule of his life was to practice the presence of God in his daily life. It's his, and, it's his way of saying dwelling, right? Dwelling. Those who dwell, yep. Right. And then the other book is uh, John Mark Comer. I'm sure some of you in this room have read this, um, Practicing the Way. Um, it's about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. And I bought this book in April, and I have read it four times. I am just absolutely, it just captures my heart. The way, the way it's written. Are you going to read it again? Uh, yes, I will. <laughs> I have all these sections highlighted that I like to go back to. Like, I guess, you know, like there are places we go in Scripture and there are places, um, you know, where God's truths uh, resonate in books. We go back to those places. That's but cool. as I've been meditating on Psalm 91, um, I felt like God is saying there's an invitation here, Meg, for more 
for more than just coming to my shelter when there's a storm. Sure. And that's what we'll talk about a little bit yeah. as we get in. But before we do that, let's uh, read through Psalm 91. So hopefully your journals or Bibles are open, and Meg's going to read the psalm for us. I'm not going to have you stand uh, this morning, but Meg's going to read Psalm 91. Psalm 91, my refuge and my fortress. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. And one thing I want to say about this psalm is uh, don't get uh, hung up on the masculine pronoun. In In this particular translation, it says, he who dwells, he who, or it says, I will deliver him. Um, In other translations, it says, whoever, it's just written to a person. It could just as well say she or her. So don't let that be a barrier for, your, barrier for you. It's whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High That's will great. abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Let me pray. Lord, okay. thank you for this opportunity for us just to talk about Psalm 91. Pray that you would bless our words. Uh, we pray every Sunday that we would leave this room, leave this broadcast different than we came because we have encountered the living God, not because of something Doug said or Meg said or not because of uh, anything other than your spirit moving. So we pray that you would speak that you would speak through whatever means you want to speak through, through uh, the rest of this conversation or just a nudge of your spirit. Thank you that you are a God who sees, you are a God who speaks. Uh, We just pray that uh, your words would go forth and our ears would be willing to hear, that seeds would be planted, that seeds would grow, and that fruit would come from that. Thank you for Meg, thank you for uh, the way she inspires me to walk more faithfully with you and pray that... uh, you would just guide our words in these next few minutes. Mm-hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So one of the things you said earlier is that, um, you know, you've had this psalm in your back pocket for a long time, probably said, well, I know that one, but as you've sat with it, uh, there's something more that has come to the surface, that there's kind of a, a, a deeper thing that God wanted to take you to. What is that more that you discovered? Yeah, so in the psalm, you know, we... We see the attributes of God, what he is, you know, like he, he protects us, like he covers us, um, you know, with his wings that we can, um, you know, abide in his shadow. But I think what God was drawing me to uh, as I was sitting with it this time is that the, the heart of the psalm, the essence of the psalm really hinges on the first verse, specifically two words in the first verse. So it's he who dwells in the shadow of the Most High. And the first of the two words is dwell. So if you think about what the word dwell means, it means to abide, to to stay, to remain. Think of a, a dwelling. A dwelling is our home. So to dwell is to make our home somewhere. And this is to dwell in the shelter of the Most High. And in this translation shelter. In other translations, the term is the secret place. So the invitation is to dwell in in the shelter or put put another way to make our home in the secret place. So what's the secret place? What's this shelter that God is inviting us to to dwell in? It's, It's not a physical structure. It's not a building that God has built for us, you know, that, you know, we can run to. But 
what God has been showing me that it is, it's, it's our heart connection with him. Mm-hmm. So For that's sure. where we are to dwell, where we are to remain is with our hearts connected to him. Like just in a posture of acknowledging that we're always in God's presence. He's always there. Yeah, and that word, one of the things we've talked a little bit about, that word shelter also is, as we started to define the word, um, it also means safety. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of where, and that's been sort of the challenges we've been pondering this psalm together, is my recognition that, um, is that really my place of safety? Is God really the place I, I find my comfort in, that I find safety in? Or is it in my retirement account? It's not, I'm not saying it's bad to have a retirement account, but we can find all kinds of things that give us a sense of security and safety. The question is, is the primary place under the shelter of the Most High? Is it, do we really believe that God is uh, the one who gives us the, the safety that we need? So it's just been a good, and I think we can all recognize that sometimes we lean into the wrong things. Uh, for safety, for security, for comfort, and you know, it's just that's been the one of the things that I've been pondering as we've been spending time around the psalm. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you? Uh, what would you say to us about applying uh, this psalm? What's the application? Right. So, what does it look like? What does it look like to be making our home? You know, in that secret place, and we, uh, you know, we have a very our days are very practical, right? We all have responsibilities in our everyday. We have jobs to get to. We have children to get to school. We have um, homes to take care of. Um, so it's doing all of those things and having a heart that is always turning toward God in the midst of it. So one of the things John Mark Comer says in his book is that it's, it's developing a habit of living in two places at one time. Like we're functioning, we're doing what, you know, what we're supposed to be doing, we're mowing the lawn. Um, at the same time, we're enjoying God's company or we're eating our cereal and at the same time, you know, we're enjoying God's company. We're turning our heart to him, we're resting in him. Maybe sometimes we're expressing words, maybe sometimes we're just smiling at him. But it's just learning to live with a constant heart connection with God. And it takes practice. I've been, you know, like I said, I've read, I've read this book four times, Brother Lawrence, I've... Practicing the presence, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, you know, and Brother Lawrence, he... Uh, I don't remember the first time we read that book, but years and years ago. Um, and one of the things Brother Lawrence uh, says in, in his book is, so he was a monk, a 17th century monk, and he lived in a monastery. And his job at the monastery was to wash the dishes. So he washed all the dishes for the brothers. And then when you live in the monastery, you also have times of prayer throughout the day when everyone would gather for prayer. And he would say whether he was washing dish- dishes in the kitchen or whether he was sitting in the chapel having prayer, there was no difference to him as far as having a presence with God. Like he was just equally had his heart attached to God in both of those places. Yeah, and I love that image because I think we can think, okay, I got to practice the presence of God means I got to do my devotional. I got to practice the presence of God. I got to read my two chapters, my five Psalms because we're doing summer in the Psalms. I got to practice the presence of God. And I'm not saying any of those are bad things. Many of those are necessary things, but that's not really what we're talking about. So practicing the presence of God isn't going to the church or going to like doing the religious activities. It really is that two places at one time. You can, I know it'll be hard, but you can watch the lions this afternoon and practice the presence of God. I think God likes football. Yeah, God, he likes football. I think he likes football. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think most most of the world world would think he likes soccer better. (laughs) He likes soccer too. Okay. (laughs) All right. Sorry, now I lost my place. Um, I want to read for you verses. Well, what about the application? Oh, is there more application? Yeah, we were the three questions. Oh, see, I oh, lost sorry. my place. That's why you're here. <laughs> I lost my place in the first service. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, what 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 is their application? Uh, well, there's three questions that um, was in Comer's book that I think. Uh, cause us, can cause us to be very thoughtful and give us practical ways of how we can practice the presence of God um, on a daily basis. So question number one, if you give it some thought, 
Um, it says, when you first come awake at the beginning of the day, where does your mind naturally go? Well, I did a little self-assessment last Sunday of my last Sunday. I'm like, okay, I need, I, I wanna, I wanna be practicing this. I wanna live in this heart connection with you, Father, all the time. So last Sunday, I woke up and I don't, I don't know what I thought of first. But then I remembered, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be dwelling in the presence of God. So then I start. I'm like, okay, God, good morning, you know, expressing some gratitude. Well, like five minutes later after I'm just adrift out there and realized that um, I had started thinking about the makeup and hair tutorials I'd watched on YouTube the night before. I thought about the Tom Brady interview I watched during the Michigan game. And I'm pretty sure I had a Whitney Houston song playing in the back of my mind as background music. What song and, was it? <laughs> uh, I don't even want to get into my head okay. again. Don't okay. bring it up. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna hum a few bars. But you know, after I was like, whoa! That was a lot, and it, you know, Henry now, and he was a Catholic priest, and the way he described his mind, he says sometimes it's like a, a tree of monkeys, like imagine a tree of monkeys, just all the, <laughs> everybody's moving around and sw you know, swinging by their tails and going, and it's like, I can so relate to that, and as I've you know, just been trying to live, learn to live into what I'm learning, it's a challenge. It is a challenge, yeah, that's a why challenge. we have to practice the abiding, practice the presence. Practice. Question number two. Oh yeah, back to the question. So who do you think, where does your mind naturally fall in the morning? And then question number two, in the little moments of space throughout your day, where does your mind fall without thinking about it? So when you're waiting in a line or you're riding in an elevator or you're walking to class um, or you're tying your shoes, um, I've just tr been trying to take notice, like where does my mind naturally go? And the invitation is for me to be turning my heart to God. Like I said, sometimes it's to say something, and I've actually been leaning more into just like smiling at him and say, you know, like, and then just imagine him smiling at me, like we're just enjoying this moment together. Um, question number three. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, what are your final thoughts as you drift off to sleep? Again, as we're closing out the day, it's another opportunity to just connect your heart with God, maybe express some gratitude, um, but just to, just to have that posture and awareness of his presence, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just, worth, it's just worth mentioning how hard this is. Um, <sighs> I like the fact that, that Brother Lawrence practicing, practicing, practicing. It takes discipline. So last night, uh, Meg and I pray together uh, in the evening when we go to bed, and she prayed about a particular something. Uh, as soon as we were done praying, it sent me on this rabbit trail. I laid in bed, like, trying to stop thinking about that thing that I was thinking about and trying to recenter my thoughts on God. Like, it, it's a fight. And I'm just telling you that so you don't get discouraged. Like, it's a fight, but it's, it's a mm -hmm. fight worth fighting. Like, God, bring me back to just thinking about you. I want to just, I want to rest in you. I don't want to spend all night churning about this thing that I can't do anything about anyway because I'm laying in bed. What difference does it make? Um, so all that just to say, like, it's everything. We're, we understand that everything we're talking about, it, it, it just doesn't happen. We have to practice we mm -hmm. have to make it a we habit. have to lean in. We have to make it a habit for sure. Okay, um, I'm going to read verses three through six, and then just ask you to respond uh, to these verses. So, verse three it says, "For he, God, will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of night." nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Talk about those verses. Yeah, well, those verses evoke a visceral response in me. I mean, if you, if you think of the language like stalking, okay, something that wastes away at noonday, like this is, this is predatory language. For and sure. we have an enemy, um, the devil, who wants to trip us up, who wants to trap us. I mean, he's got snares out there all over the place um, that he wants us to fall into. Uh, 
1 Peter 5, 7, I think it is, says, you know, that he prowls around like a roaring lion looking to devour us. And these verses remind me, we are under attack. He wants to tempt us to sin, and he wants to tempt us to um, respond poorly when people sin against us. He wants to do anything he can to keep us from having that heart connection with God where we're dwelling in him. Um, And I think that when we're dwelling, we are less susceptible to falling into any of his traps. For sure. I think one of the things we talked about too is, and, and I've said this before, you can't abide, you can't dwell, you can't practice the presence of God and intentionally sin at the same time. One, it, it keeps us in the right place of making better decisions, but two, you can't do both simultaneously. When you decide to go to a place that you shouldn't go to on your computer, you are making a decision not to dwell, right? You are taking yourself out of the protection of God. You are putting yourself in harm's way, and it's just, it's just worth remembering uh, that picture. And just, I do think the language is, uh, it's vivid. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that he's coming after us. Uh, and then just the other thing I want to point out, yeah, there are, there are um, all these forces working against us. But to remember, it says, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that starts in the dark. These things are out there. We don't need to fear it. Just dwell. Just dwell with God. Things will happen. Mm-hmm. Things are bad. Things are going to happen. Um, but we don't need to be afraid of it. And I will tell you, as I was thinking, uh, meditating on these things, I was like, "What is this? Like, what is this in a practical sense, Father?" Because in our context, we don't necessarily have daily have the threat of a plague, you know, or pestilence. Um, and one of the things God showed me about myself, this is partial disclosure, is that. Um, for the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, for me, that thing that nips at my heels is, um, is to, the enemy is tempting me uh, to use my tongue in a destructive way. And that's something that, you know, is, is a struggle for me. I, you know, I'll say the wrong thing. I'll, um, you know, pick a fight with him. And so that, 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 deadly, <laughs> that deadly pestilence stalking me is often my own tongue, that I have to dwell in God's presence in order to tame it. Uh, Verse 9 and 10, if you want to look at them, uh, I think we spent as much time talking about these two verses as any, uh, because I think there's a sense that it it just doesn't seem true with our lived experience. Verse 9 says, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is your refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. I think even what we experienced yesterday uh, with Brother Phil, it's hard to reconcile this. Sounds like nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. Yeah, if if you think of a tent as like your family. Your tent is, you know, those people. Talk about that for just a bit. Uh, well, just to add to what you were saying, that's, I, I think about my tent is my family, my people. And it says, you know, no plague will come near your tent, which I see that is any harm or suffering. Um, and that's, that's not the case, right? We've all experienced um, difficulties um, and hardships uh, for ourselves and families and, you know, all, all the sure. people around us. Um, in fact, there's three kinds of sin. There's a sin we commit. There's a sin that's committed against us. And there's just the sin around us, the sin of the world that, the aff- fallen world. Yeah, that affects all of us. It's part of living in a fallen world. And I think of Job, um, God allowed evil to befall Job, and Job was a righteous and upright man. And, um, you know, there's mystery in that. There is mystery. Yeah, that's what we talked a little bit about, that, you know, if anybody deserved an explanation of suffering, it was Job. And, you know, the explanation was, if I told you, you wouldn't understand anyway. Um, God says, my ways are higher than your ways. You know, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And, uh, you know, so I think there's, a, there's an element in this that we just have to recognize that uh, we don't always understand. I know when I sat with uh, Trina and the family yesterday and we prayed and we just talked about how good God is, there's, there's no... Mm. Both can be true. God mm-hmm. is good and there is suffering in the world. And 
uh, we just need to navigate that tension that exists and not to, to look at a verse like this and think we've failed because something bad is taking place. But I would also say, which has been part of our conversation, uh, things will go better for you if you do things God's way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're protected from anything, but I can tell you, when you step out of the protection of God's will, when you step out and do whatever you want to do, when you're not in obedience to God, uh, you will open yourself up for a lot more chaos and a lot more suffering. Sin never reaps a profit. It always has a cost. So there is benefit, real benefit, true benefit of living God's way, of following God's statutes, of doing things under the, the shadow of his wing and doing it the right way. So uh, I, just, I just think there's tension in that verse and we just gotta allow the tension to be there. Uh, Jesus said, look, you can follow me, you will suffer, but take heart, I've overcome the world, right? There, the, we, don't get to, we don't get to say yes to Jesus and then have a perfect world. Those of you who got baptized today, you, you may have a hard week because you've taken a stand and said, I'm gonna follow Jesus. The last thing Satan wants is you to follow, don't be surprised. The, Temptation comes, difficulties come, lean into God, lean into the goodness of God along the way. And to add to that, I think, too, it says, you know, no evil will be allowed to befall you. We don't know what God is sparing us from. For sure. Right? That we don't know what he's holding back. You know, that when, when um, uh, the enemy was going to attack Job, God said to him, you know, do whatever you want, but don't harm the man. Um, or, you know, don't, like, you can't take, take his, his life. life. Yeah, obviously yep. he's harmed. You, you know, you can't take his life. We don't know what God is holding back from us. But, you know, I had an experience yesterday where I did kind of. More disclosure. Yeah, more disclosure, transparent. Okay, I'm going to really scare you guys. But yesterday I was driving down 94 on my way to a football game. I'm eating popcorn in the car. I think I had just finished talking to him. I'm driving along and I realized, oh, there's Woodward. And I, you know, I wasn't in the right lane and someone was in my blind spot and I didn't, you know, quickly turned off the ramp and he laid on the horn. I mean, it was, I'm telling you, it was so, it was this close that I could have been in an accident. And I was, um, I felt so bad about that. I probably, I thought about it a dozen times since that, you know, why did God spare me from that? It would have been just a tragedy. Who knows how many people would have been involved? And why did he you know, spare that man? And I just thought I could have destroyed that man's life, his family's life, all of that, but, and, and God spared me. So he is out there holding things back that we might not even see. Yeah, for sure. Realize. Yeah. No question. Um, so let's just talk about the last stanza of the verse and how things change in it and use that a way of, of kind of wrapping things up. So the last few verses, I know, mean a lot to you. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just looking for where it is so I can read it exactly. Here it is. But yeah, I love this part because if you notice, the psalm kind of takes a shift here. So everything else we've been talking about has been written by the author, which is... Um, beautiful. But then you'll see the last three verses are in quotation marks, and that's when God speaks. Like the author has said all of the, all of the things that he has said, and then God speaks to us directly. And he says, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And what grabs me is that first sentence, because he holds fast to me in love. It doesn't say, because he doesn't sin, because she's perfect, because she does everything right. Because she says, read her five psalms this week. Because she read her five psalms every day. Because she went to church. Um, because she, you know, didn't goof up on the highway. Um, <laughs> you know, he says, because you hold fast to me in love. And what God is saying is the invitation is for you to love me. Love me, dwell with me. Um, the next line it says, because you know me, he'll protect us because we know him. It's, it's, it's the intimacy it's that God wants. For it's sure. the intimacy. It's that heart connection, making our home in the secret place. It's that heart connection. We're always turning our heart to God, always saying, you know, saying I love you or not saying anything, just enjoying yeah. his company. Um, so 
We're gonna, I'm going to ask Meg to kind of pray that last verse over us, but before we do, uh, whoever's in the back doing the slides, if you could pull up the first question again. Um, I just think it would be good for you to write the question down. Maybe take a picture of the question, um, and maybe this just becomes your application for the next little bit. Like, really just practice waking up in the morning and, and saying to yourself, what's the first? Uh, when you first come awake, I would never use that term. When you first come awake uh, at the beginning of your day, where does your mind naturally go? Uh, we just kind of wanted to leave that question back up there uh, just as a way of you making some practical um, application to this. Um, I'm gonna have Meg pray uh, over us and then we'll wrap things up. Okay. I'm going to pray the last three verses over you. Father, I thank you so much that you love us. I thank you for the invitation that you give us to hold fast to you in love, that this isn't formulaic or about performance. It's about having a heart connection with you and that you will deliver us and that you protect us and that you invite us to know you. Mm -hmm. Thank you that we can call to you in at, you know, any time of day, we can call to you and you will answer us. When trouble comes, that you are with us, that you will rescue us and honor us. You promise us long life to satisfy us. And I know sometimes we think of life from um, a temporal perspective and we think of long life as years. But I know that you speak of the fullness of life mm -hmm. and you speak of life abundant and you speak of eternal life. And thank you for your salvation, your salvation that you extend to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And uh, Father, I just ask that you would help us, help us to live in that beautiful place of a heart connection with you mm -hmm. all the time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Meg. Hey, um, Meg and I had the opportunity this week to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, for the screening of a documentary uh, that was produced on the uh, plight of illiteracy in the United States. And one of the uh, organizations that's featured in that documentary is SOAR. And it was just a wonderful thing. We got to go to the Library of Congress. We had con congressional members there watching it. It was, it was really uh, phenomenal. But it was a reminder to me of the gift that we have uh, with our partnership with SOAR, where we have an opportunity uh, to teach every willing third grader to read at or above grade level. Um, Meg and I are both serving as mentors, but uh, I just want to stop to encourage you to strongly consider being a mentor as well and changing the trajectory of a young person's life. So there's a kiosk back there. Uh, serving one hour a week, uh, helping a child to read uh, can make all the difference in uh, just really where that child's gonna Can go. I just add something to yeah, that? Watching the documentary, um, and we've been doing SOAR for 20 years, something that I never really thought about is illiteracy is often multi-generational. So a, a lot of the children who are in the program and have trouble reading, um, their parents can't read either. And their grandparents can't read either. And so they don't have someone to help them with their homework, to be able to read a book to them. The exposure that they have to uh, learning to read is in school and often you're just, you know how school can be sometimes, you just become part of the crowd and you don't get individual attention. So it really is a um, important opportunity to serve in this way to, yeah. Um, to. Yeah, I, I would much rather we have a waiting list for mentors and not a waiting list for children. So just for stop sure. at the information counter, get signed up to be a mentor. It's an easy serve, an hour a week is great. You can do it. Uh, if you're in, still in school, you can still do it. The kids that are there are elementary uh, kids, but we would love for you to be a part of that. Uh, the people that prayed for you this morning, there's just a couple things that they heard uh, that God is talking to some of you about just a call to live uh, more holy and be more set apart. So um, we'd love to pray for you to help you with that. And there's someone or a few people who are struggling uh, with disunity in the church over the election season. Um, if that's just been a burden for you and you want to get some prayer over that, we'd love to have you. If you have a physical ailment, spiritual, 
difficulties, whatever it is that you need. Uh, we believe that God still heals. We believe that God answers our prayers. So we just encourage you to come down, meet with one of the prayer warriors down here. Let them pray over you. Uh, God bless you. Thanks for being here, being a part of this. Thank you, Meg, for uh, the hard work that you put into this. And uh, come back next week as we experience another psalm. God bless you. Blessings.